So Bill Konkoleski will be presenting about his lifetime interactions with the ETs. Bill Konkoleski has been the state director of the Michigan chapter of the Mutual UFO Network since 2004. After a lifetime of his own UFO and abduction encounters, he spent the last three decades actively investigating these otherworldly phenomena, trying to make some sense of the bizarre events that have happened to him personally. What he's discovered confronting these cosmic mysteries is that reality is far stranger than he could have ever imagined. Konkoleski is the author of the autobiographical Experiencer Raised in Two Worlds, as well as the newly released Experiencer Two Worlds Collide and his personal abduction experiences have been chronicled in the sci-fi documentary, Abduction Diaries, streaming documentary, Abducted by Aliens, UFO Encounters of the Fourth Kind, and the ABC News special, UFOs Seeing is Believing. He has also served as consultant to Netflix Unsolved Mysteries, the History Channel's Hangar One and UFO Hunters, National Geographic Channel's The Truth Behind, as well as the, sci the Science Channel's Uncovering Aliens and Close Encounters. So it's my pleasure. He's got his, uh, he still has his camera off. So he's got, his, there's his camera on. So we're going to want to make Bill host. If you make Bill host or at least co-host or presenter, that'd be fine. Minnesota MUFON, people here in New Brighton and people watching on Zoom, please give a big round of applause and welcome Mr. Bill Konkoleski. Well, uh, thanks so much for having me as part of your meeting. Thank you uh, for joining us. Great. Um, thanks so much again, everybody, for having me uh, be able to present to you today. Um, I am going to talk about my personal experiences uh, with contact. I have uh, sort of a lifelong experiencer, and um, I have been the state director uh, for Michigan MUFA now since uh, 2004. I've been a 30-year member, and along with the um, stuff I've done directly with MUFON, I've done some other stuff with some TV productions, some on which I appear, some on which I just assist. Um, and then also I have written two books and contributed to five other books. The two books that I've personally written are about my experiences, my personal experiences. The first book I wrote, um, Experiencer Raced in Two Worlds, is about growing up um, roughly my first 20 years of life with this experience of contact. And then I have a second book that covers roughly the next five years, a very intense period of five years of my early 20s. I have more than enough material for a third book, but um, there's stuff on there that's a little on the personal side that I'm not just uh, quite sure uh, that I'd like to share just yet. So through my life, I've had multiple UFO sightings, um, multiple experiences on board. Um, I've had experiences with a variety of different non-human entities, um, as well as some paranormal activity, premonitions, out-of-body experiences, poltergeist activity, ghost sightings, and also strange things going on with time. I'm going to cover a fair chunk of what's happened to me in this presentation. Um, there's certainly a lot more. Uh, that I won't be able to to cover everything, but um, hopefully uh, this should give a good overview. I will also say up front, I'm not one of those individuals uh, where you're going to hear from me that um, I've had contact with the Galactic Federation or that I had a previous life on another world, anything along those lines. Mostly, I like to focus on sort of where the rubber meets the road. Um, the human experience on the earthly level with this sort of phenomenon. And um, I've had a few things um, to cover uh, whether or not um, I've got anything wrong with me. Um, I took the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Index Test, uh, which indicated that um, I suffered from, I have suffered from stress-related um, causes, but that I am not fantasy prone. I also did a study, a sleep study here in Detroit, where they monitored my sleep for three days um, to, to try to see if there was anything unusual with my sleep pattern that might be causing some sort of hallucinations or anything like that. And apparently uh, there in this particular study, there were a number of individuals who uh, self-identified as experiencers, 
and a number of people that were the control. Um, and I happened to um, do better than anybody in the experiencer category or even in the control category in terms of how well I sleep. And the big thing when this is part of your life, as it's been part of my whole life, is trying to find meaning in, in what's happened. Um, I'm going to start off um, in my very early years. Uh, they came to me. My very first experience in life is my very um, first memory in life. Uh, age two, I was laying in my room and a little gray guy came in, stared down at me over the crib wall. And this was not a memory that uh, uh, several years later, I was like, oh, yeah, I think this might have happened to me when I was younger. No, the moment it happened, it burned into my memory and I never forgot it. Um, it was there staring down at me. I screamed for my parents. My mother said, uh, just go back to sleep, go back to sleep. And the thing was, I hadn't yet fallen asleep. And then after the thing walked out of the room, um, I believe it went to my brother's room, but I can't be absolutely sure. Uh, I'm the youngest of five and kind of a curious thing. My two oldest brothers have a number of high strangeness experiences. We could go toe to toe. The next two brothers, none between them, absolutely zero. And then it jumps to me and uh, I pick up at the same level that my oldest brothers have had experiences. <clears throat> my next remembered experience as a kid uh, was I was in my room. It was two o'clock roughly on a, in the afternoon. Um, my brothers were at school. My dad was at work. My mom was outside pulling weeds. And I went into my room just to take a quick nap. And the moment I got into bed, I instantly, uh, there was no hesitation. I instantly felt a full on vibration throughout my body. And then I felt a tugging at my chest. And then um, oddly enough, what they did was actually pull me out of body. I was out of body in my room. Um, my bed, my body was still laying there in the bed behind me. And three little gray guys were there and they had this sort of playful demeanor. When I was young, having these type of experiences, they were gentle with me. Um, they, they weren't as aggressive or, or anything like that. They just treated me, you know, a, a little bit more kindly than the experience that I got when I was a little older. But so these three little guys said, uh, okay, come out here in the hallway. And I did, I floated out there and they wanted to see how much control I had of my out of body form. And they, they can, they had this little test for me, which was, I, I lived in a tri-level house and my room was on the top level of the tri-level and they wanted to see how well I could float down the stairs and into the front TV room. And so I did fairly easily. I just drifted down. And then when I was there in the room, I, um, stopped in sort of a falling leaf motion and they were very excited they were like oh yay you know you did it um you know no smiles or anything like that it was all telepathic um they were very happy and then um i was like oh this is great i have to tell my mother and they're like no 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 you don't tell anybody this is between us and i thought that was kind of strange and then i felt the tingling all over again found myself back in bed, in body. I got up. I walked all over the house looking for these little guys. I couldn't find them anywhere. I thought maybe they'd still be hanging around. And so then what I decided to do was like, well, you know, I floated down the stairs when they were around. Let me see if I can do this by myself. So I walked to the stairs, laid down on my stomach, and crawled down the, the stairs face first. Uh, it was not the same type of experience. <laughs> and so I, I didn't actually tell my mom. I did not for, for quite a while. Um, I, you know, uh, after a while I figure out, yeah, I'll, I'll just start telling people. But it did take a while before I started to share. 
Now, one of the things in my house growing up is that um, there was a rule that nobody talked about their experiences around me since I was um, six years younger than my youngest brother. Um, they didn't want to influence me. They didn't want to scare me. Um, if I was to tell something to them, you know, they were to listen compassionately, but not share their own stories. So I didn't even find out about my older brother's stuff until I was much uh, older in my early teens. And um, so my next remembered experience of them, I was seven. I was laying in my bed and this black circle, like a void appeared over the bed and this metal rope um, looked like a metal rope dropped out of this whole black hole that appeared in my ceiling. And it started whipping around, whizzing around really fast, really crazily. And it started to shoot off sparks. And, and as it shot off sparks, I felt that familiar vibration in me. And then I found myself in a very small room that I consider sort of to be like a mud room on a UFO where they are, they have to make sure that I'm clean, that my energy is right, whatever it is that they're testing for or, or adjusting. And after I was in there with two little gray guys and after they figured out that I was okay, I, I they let me in uh, to the, the next room. In the next room, there was sort of a solid uh, block in the center of the room. And I understood that to be a bed. It didn't look like a very comfortable bed. And now there were three of them in there. There was a two from the previous room, and now a third one was in the room with me. And so I'm I'm in this room with the three of them, and they all lead the room. They go out to uh, the side. They go out to the left door, essentially. And I'm like, well, that's strange. Why would they leave me just in here by myself, unattended? And so as they went out the one door, I went out the other door. There was a door to the right. And I walked around this sort of slowly curving hallway until I got to the end. And there was a small room, almost large, not much bigger than a closet. And it had some sort of metallic contraption in it that felt like it was a furnace. I don't know what it was really. And so I'm like, okay, I hit a dead end. It's time to walk back. And as I turned around to walk back, I realized that they had been following me. I didn't know that. And so the three of them were there just standing in the hallway and they ushered me into this room off to the side. And in the room was a, a taller gray being. Now the gray beings that had been ushering me around were about three feet tall. This one was about five feet tall, looked pretty much identical to the other ones except just a little bit taller. And um, so they, he, I knew that I was supposed to sit in this chair in the room that looked very much like a dentist chair. So not very inviting. Um, and as I sat in the chair, I found that I was magnetically attached to the chair is the best way I can put it. There were no physical straps or anything like that, but somehow I could not move my arms off the armrests over the back or anything like that and the taller being that i got a very sort of medical very doctory vibe comes over to me and says be really good and you get to see the color blue and i was like well that's strange you know i'm a kid you know you think a kid gets a sucker or a sticker or something like that for going to the doctor and he's gonna let me see the color blue now his eyes were a deep black like the little guys were a deep black and um, as I'm sitting there in a chair, then I feel a very sharp pain in my upper arm. And I look down and I see that my arm is cut. There's a slip mark across my arm. And then as I look down at it, I see it start to heal across. And suddenly it's all healed up. There's a scar there. I still have that scar. I sort of have a close up picture of it. I'm here. I'm not sure how well the picture comes out. But uh, then I look up at the, the the being like, you know, what the heck are you doing? Why did you do that? And as I lifted, uh, lifted uh, up my eyes to look at it, 
um, his eyes turned from a deep set black to a bright cerulean blue, very bright blue. And the eyes were tranquilizing, mesmerizing. I felt really good, felt really at peace. And then I um, uh, passed out and woke up the next morning in my bed. And um, the scar was there. And it was very um, disturbing that I had that physical evidence. And later on that afternoon, I'm in the backyard. I'm playing uh, with uh, my friend across the street. I'm seven, he's six. We're climbing trees in my backyard when this mist rolls into the backyard. Uh, it looked like smoke, but it was very cool. It was almost like fog machine smoke. And it rolled into the backyard. And as it did, there was a single gray being inside. And the gray being came up to me and telepathically asked me, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm okay. And then it seemed satisfied. And then it kept going. And this cloud, this little cloud of whatever it was, this fog, um, moved with it. And he walked into the next door neighbor's backyard and then kept going, just walked off into the distance, <laughs> carrying this big uh, smoke uh, cloud with him. And um, several years later now, many years later, my friend uh, from across the street, we still keep in touch. Uh, he very clearly remembers the day that the fog rolled through the backyard. However, he did not see anybody in the fog. <coughs> when I joined MUFON in 93, um, the state director at the time, Shirley Coyne, uh, did several regression sessions on me. Uh, this was one of the one sessions that she uh, had me go through. It uh, sharpened several of the things that I remembered, but it didn't add anything more um, than what I was able to tell you right now. Yep, oh, other direction. <clears throat> okay, so moving beyond my childhood into my younger years, um, <clears throat> they seemed to not be as playful or friendly. Um, things started to be all business. They would come and they would take me and uh, take me several times. I had, uh, there were certain weeks that, they would take me two or three times and it was a, it was, it was a pretty rough time. It was all very physical. Um, it's also the time while I remember the most evenings where I would have the onset of an experience coming on. It was also the time period where I have the least clear memories of what happened when I went on board. Um, and just to show you how strange my household was growing up, Yes, there's Pepsi and Coke in the house here. And no, those cigarettes were not mine. <laughs> but one of the things that um, my experience has led me to is setting up an obstacle course in my room, especially during this time in my teens where it was really rough on me. Um, um, starting by the door, um, the, my dresser was right next to the door. And what I would do is I would wedge a snare drum stick between the back of the dresser and the door. So the door could only open so far. And then if he did, it would make a knocking sound. And in front of the door, I put a floor fan so that even if I close my eyes, I could feel a breeze, uh, the breeze on me. And if anything blocked that breeze, I would know that something was standing there or whatever and, and blocking that air current. Um, I generally slept with the lights on, uh, with either the radio on or television on, and I always had the windows, curtains shut so that nobody could do a recon on me from outside. Um, when I could, I had the dog sleep in the room with me, and she wasn't a very big or aggressive dog. She was just a little thing. She looked just like Benji from those Benji movies, so not not a very scary dog, but still. Um, some company is better than none. And then I also uh, put obstacles in my room. My floor was quite cluttered with all sorts of stuff that um, hopefully somebody would trip on that wasn't aware 
of the layout of my obstacle course. And none of this worked. None of this seemed to work at all. Um, they still came when they wanted to, and I couldn't stop these experiences. And although I tried, I did my best to do that, do so, I had a situation where one night I was taken, I was in my teens at the time, and I was taken on board and brought in front of a mantis being. This was the first time I'd ever seen one of these things. And I thought it was interesting that although I um, came up with the term mantis myself, um, that I would come to find that's a reg actually a regular term for this thing. So I'm brought in front of this thing, and it's got tremendous energy about it. Very strong, powerful energy. And it's saying to me telepathically, stop resisting. Just go along with the program. If you go along with the program, you'll see the benefits. If you resist the program, it doesn't help anybody. It was like, you know, I felt like I was as a teenager being brought in front of the principal at the high school. And it, uh, it was a very um, scary experience. And I also don't think it really worked much either. I, I still, um, you know, as a teen, you know, you're kind of rebellious in general, but, you know, it, you know, take that up another level and have these things come to you and try to tell you what you should do. You know, it's a big heck no. So um, I'm not sure that his little talk with me really had that much of, uh, of an effect. But there was a, a, a turning point that would happen much, uh, not much longer after that. For um, my birthday, my um, it would have been my birthday, nineteen eighty eight. I got uh, communion, uh, Whitley Strieber's communion, and this was the first thing that really put context to my experiences. You know, there wasn't anything that I'd seen or anything like that that seemed to resonate with me, like, like oh okay, that's kind of what's happening to me. It wasn't until that book that I, I saw, oh, wow, yeah, I recognize these events. Um, this pattern makes sense. I get it. It was a good starting point. And I would go on to read other abduction books, certainly. But, um, of course, that was the one that really made a big uh, impression on me, um, changed everything. <coughs> and I read the book, over the course of a weekend, which is a record for me. <laughs> I kept reading and reading and reading. Like I'm like, okay, maybe somewhere in there it's going to tell me how to stop this. Somewhere in this is going to tell me what it's all about. And you don't really get that. You just get somebody's personal experiences of what they went through. And then, in fact, at one point I was so into the book, so scared at this one uh, part that I was reading, I accidentally kicked the blanket off of my bed and screamed, <laughs> And my parents came running in and I had to tell them, of course, with great, great embarrassment, like, oh, I'm sorry, I, this book is scary. <laughs> That's why I yelled. Um, so, but then not much after that, um, the at, for Christmas, actually, Strieber's Transformation, his second book, was already out by that time. And I asked for it for Christmas and I got it. And unlike communion that I read very quickly, transformation, I read slowly. I was nervous um, about finding out things I didn't necessarily want to hear about the phenomena. It was completely unlike communion where I was looking for happy things to help me. This one, I was dreading things um, that I might read. And at one point in the book, um, and, and reading the book was very much like, oh, yes, that happened to me. It was like a check mark. Yes, that's happened to me. This happened to me. And then, no, that hasn't happened to me. No, that hasn't happened to me, whatever. So there was one of the things Strieber says at one point in Transformation that he's sitting around and then he gets this sort of telepathic download saying, hey, Whitley, come to the park. 
and he does and there they are and i was like oh that's one of those things i can put the check mark on that's never happened to me anything like that and then right when i thought that i received this thought that pushed into my head it was not anything that i internally generated it came from outside pushed in my head and said finish the book and we will prove to you that we exist and it stuck there it was not like a natural organic internal thought it was just something stuck in my head that i, I it didn't seem like a thought of my own origin and then i started reading the book very slowly even more slowly and then um, at one point, when I realized there was only one chapter left, I was like, I don't know if I want to finish this book. And so I set it aside. I said, one day I'll be brave enough to finish. And there was, this was in February and about middle of the way through the month, I had, oddly enough, I had a dream where I finished the book. And so I... Um, this is I'm a high school senior at this point, just to put some context to that. So I um, said, OK, well, this must be the sign that today is the day that I'm going to do it. So I'll just knock this out right away. So I read the book, the last chapter right when I woke up and then nervously all day, I was like, gosh, I wonder what that sign is going to be. I wonder if there is going to be a sign. There's probably not going to be a sign. I don't know. This is really weird. And I was just terrified the whole day. And that night, um, I'm like, I don't, want to, I don't want to be alone. I want to be with friends. And so I'm out with my two buddies that I had, best buddies in high school. We're in uh, my friend's uh, Chevette. I think I got a picture of them here. <laughs> I very cleverly disguise their identities. So the, the guys on the immediate left and right of me are in the car and my friend Kyle's Chevette and my body Don is with us. And we are, we pull up in front of a friend's house um, waiting for her to get off from work. It's about 9 PM and in Michigan at 9 PM in February, it's dark and it was a nice clear night. And as we're parked there, um, a blue ball of light about the size of a car, about the height of two telephone poles, comes slowly tumbling, arcing over the car. We all three watch it go overhead. And then this white ball of light, very small, comes and ping pongs all over the sky, just really quickly zigzags all over the sky. And then a red ball of light appears in the center of the sky grows to the size of the full moon, which is quite large, and then shrinks, and then that disappears. And my friend Kyle, um, the guy that's uh, whose car it is, uh, he's the one, I'm the one looking down here with the button on. Um, my uh, tall, thin friend off to one side, he's like, yeah, we should uh, tell the police. I'm like, yeah, we're high school seniors. Yeah, we should tell the police that we saw a UFO and see how well that goes. And then my other friend says, oh, OK, well, maybe we should tell the local Air National Guard base. Selfridge Air National Guard base wasn't far from where I was living in Sterling Heights, Michigan. And I'm like, OK, yeah, so we're not going to tell the cops, but we're going to tell the military. I don't know about that. And so the next day at work, um, yeah, I didn't know who to tell. Um, next day at work, I go up to one of my coworkers and say, hey, you never guessed what I saw last night. And she responds, oh, did you see the UFO? That was not the answer I was expecting from her. I was expecting like, oh, what did you see? So anyways, I'm like, UFO, why'd you say that? And she said, the maintenance guy that the, where I worked at the time, which was Burlington Co-Factory, um, she said he saw a UFO. So I, I go up to him and I ask him, I'm like, hey, Carl, what'd you see last night? And he says, there was this blue ball of light that was going down the street where he lived. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's creepy. He didn't see a white ball of light, a red ball of light, just that blue ball of light. So <clears throat> I go to uh, um, back to my coworker out on the floor, um, Melissa, and I say, hey, um, you know, I, I was about to tell her my story. And then I see that she's crying. I'm like, why are you crying? 
She goes, when Carl told me about his UFO sighting, it reminded me of when I was a little girl in Tennessee. Um, my parents were in the front seat. Me and my sister were in the back seat. It was a nighttime and we're driving down this dirt road when there was this 30 foot disc landed on the side of the road. And um, she goes, my dad was like, oh, this is interesting. Let's go check it out. And she said that she, her sister, her mom were all screaming, no, no, we got to get out of here. And um, ultimately, uh, according to her version of the story, they didn't stop. And then he did actually drive off. But she said it was such a terrifying moment that she was so not ready for that uh, she got she gets emotional every time she she even thinks about it. So going back to the the thought, I'm like, oh, prove to me that you exist. I'm like, well, very interesting. The sign came on the day that I finished the book. It was very clearly extraterrestrial in origin. It wasn't ghost-like or some other sort of paranormal phenomena. And I was not only with two witnesses, uh, but the next day, yet another witness. I'm like, that's a pretty good sign, you know? And it was also very interesting to me because it was an, it was like a handshake from them. Like, you know, we're not going to come down and grab you and toss you on some bed or make you do some weird experiments or anything weird like that. We're just going to give you a display and uh, it, it's going to be a good display and you're going to be convinced and satisfied. And, and I was, and that led me into my adult path. Um, so here I am, high school graduate, 1989. And going on to the next thing that would happen um, not long after that, that was kind of interesting um, in that I think it was building off of that one display that I had seen. It was um, the summer of 89, so maybe about six months after that last encounter i was in my house in my kitchen late at night it was about three in the morning i was quite a night owl now that i was out of high school um and i could pretty much make my own hours i stayed up as late as i could any given night so that i wouldn't have to be um laying in bed um defenseless when they came i was going to be up it's going to be awake i was going to be ready for them so this particular night in the kitchen, I'm in just um, drawing cars in my sketchbook. And I get that feeling that they always give off when they're around. That sort of um, electrical, tingly feeling in the atmosphere. And while I didn't see them, I could tell that it was coming from the backyard. I'm like, oh, they're in the backyard. Here I am alone in the kitchen. It's three in the morning. Um, and so um, based upon building off the rapport that I had with them with that last sighting I had, I, I said out loud, like, if you're here, I don't want to see you. But if you want to communicate, you can call me on the phone. There is a phone hanging on the wall uh, of, of the kitchen. And um, about five minutes after I said that, the phone rang once. And I waited and waited about another five minutes. And then I picked up the phone and it was a dial tone. And then at that point, the energy around me started to dissipate and go away. So I was like, whew, you know, I dodged that one. And then the next day, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, really, it would have been neat had I actually just dashed to the phone, picked it up and saw what would happen. Why did I wait so long? You know, they gave up their patience on me and they took off. I'm like, if this ever happens again, I'm like, I'm getting that phone. So about a year later, maybe even exactly a year later, for all I know, summer 1990, I'm in the, I'm in the, uh, the kitchen 3 a.m. sketching and I start to get that same feeling again that they're in the backyard. And so I said out loud, if you're here, I don't want to see you. Please call me on the phone. And this time I won't hesitate. I'll just answer the phone. 
And sure enough, the phone rings right away. And before I have a chance to think about it, I dash to the phone. I do. I race to the phone, pick it up as quickly as I can, with, and again, get a dial tone. And so I hang up. But this time, the energy didn't really quite go away That's the way it did the previous year. And I was still nervous. And I'm like, oh, gosh, what's going to happen now? And so I decided to go get my dog um, to keep me company. Everybody else in the house is, of course, asleep. And the dog, once I go to get her, she thinks we're going for a walk. <laughs> She's like, oh, wow, we're going outside. We're going to go outside. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This is the last place that I wanted to be is outside. And, but she was just whimpering and running around in circles. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll let you out. But I'm going to let you out in the front yard, not the backyard. So I go and I open the door and I let her out. And she's just standing on the porch looking back at me. Like, aren't we going for a walk? Because that's what it means when we go out the front door. We're going for a walk. You're not even outside. You're just staring at me. So I'm like, oh, gosh. So I go out and we go as far as the corner uh, where the street is. And I'm looking around nervously. And then I see that the cloudless sky, I should say what I thought was a cloudless sky, I saw a single cloud over my house. It was very sharply sculpted like a disc and it seemed self-luminescent and it was just there hanging over my house. Uh, and so I'm like, oh, that's not normal. And as I'm watching it, I see it slowly back away from me, like it's flying off um, towards the horizon. And then it picks up speed and then suddenly goes Foomp! and disappears up into the sky. And my dog didn't seem to notice anything. You know, they say, oh, dogs have a special sense for this sort of thing. It didn't affect her one way or the other. So it was about four in the morning at this point. I go in the house and I stay awake until my dad got up for work about 530. And then I fell asleep. And the next day, um, my buddy Kyle uh, wakes me up at noon. Um, comes knocking on the door and says, hey, um, our friend TJ is having a birthday party in a, in a few weeks. Uh, do I, you know, so uh, just to let me know, because he knows that I would want to go to this thing. And so I am like, okay. So I tell him about my experience from the last night. Actually, that was the first thing. He's like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, you never get believe what happened to me last night. And I went through it. And then he, his response was like, oh, okay. Um, so TJ's having this party, right? So, and then as he's telling it to me, I'm like, I'm like, oh, our friend Vicky's going to be there. And he's like, oh yeah, probably. I'm like, no, no, she's going to be there. And she's going to be my new girlfriend. It was this strange knowing. I had to, like a certainty. Like this wasn't any, uh, you know, she'd been part of our group of friends for some time. I never really thought about her as somebody to date or anything like that. She was just always kind of there. And, and he's like, oh, you know, you're going to try to, you know, ask her out. I'm like, no, this isn't even going to take any effort. It's just going to happen. And so sure enough, TJ's birthday party comes up. There's um, the guy I call TJ in my stories, my books and everything. And then. Here is Vicky. And so at the party, um, we're playing croquet, of all things, in, in TJ's backyard. And Vicky and I end up being partners. And then I think it was her that said, oh, she says something like, oh, what are we going to do next? I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, after the party. And it just went from there. And then so um, she became my girlfriend. And yeah, things uh, worked out pretty well. Um, we had uh, started dating in the summer of 1990. And in January of um, 91, something really strange happened. I had this dream, because I don't know what else to call it, but... Uh, <laughs> I'll say it like this is because this is really how it went. I became aware that I was standing on 
a dirt road that was covered with snow. Um, I had no jacket on. It was cold. The wind was blowing. Um, the houses were all dark. There were big trees all around me. And it was 100% real. As I stepped forward, I could feel the snow giving away under my feet. And everything was just as vivid as as life. And I'm I'm looking around and I'm like, what the heck is going on? Where am I? And I didn't even have, and I was trying to pull, push back into my short-term memory. I'm like, what was I just doing that somehow I'm here now? And I came up to a little gray house on the side of the road. Um, I'm like, oh, maybe somebody's here that, you know, I can ask, you know, where am I or, or what's going on? Something along those lines. And as I approach the house, there's a little gray guy in the driveway. And, and right when I look at it, um, I could see its eyes this time turn from black to white. And I felt every negative emotion I had ever felt in my life all at once. Pain, sorrow, shame, jealousy, name it. Every single negative emotion detonated within me. And I felt like I completely blew up into smithereens at that point like complete disintegration and then suddenly oops i'll get ahead of myself um i open my eyes and i'm in my bed i'm laying in my bed it's in the afternoon it's two in the afternoon it's january and i'm like i am a completely drenched in sweat and i'm still living at home at the time my mom gives a couple quick knocks on the door walks in drops a letter on my chest. And there's a reason why I'm getting into the Vicky stuff. Um, because it really is all about my interaction with the beings in my early 20s. So uh, the chest, the letter on my chest, I look at it and it's from Vicky. So I'm like, I don't know what to do because of that strange experience I had. So I'm like, well, here's something to do. I could read this letter. <laughs> So I open it up, and in my mind, all I'm doing is thinking that little being, and I, I, I refer to it as a creature. I'm like, the creature, the creature. And so as I'm reading the letter, it's a Dear John letter saying, Bill, it was great, you know, but I decided, you know, I got to do my own thing. It's not you, it's me, all that, and whatever. And all the time I'm reading the letter, I'm like, the creature, the creature. And now and at the very bottom of the letter, it says, oh, and you can call me if you want. I'm like, oh, that's something to do. First, I read this letter. Now I can call the girl. It's something to do because I had just, my mind was blown. And here was an imperative. Here's, here was direction. Make a phone call. So I get up. I walk over to the phone in the next room and dial her up. And this was on a Monday. And she says, oh, uh, I call her. And she's like, oh, is this Bill? And I'm like, yes. And she's like, oh, did you get the letter? I'm like, yes. And I'm just thinking the creature, the creature. And she says, oh, uh, she goes, you know, I sent that, you know, at the beginning of the weekend, but we had such a good time on Sunday that I changed my mind. Is it okay if we stay together? And I'm like, just saying yes to every, whatever she said, I'm saying yes. And all I could think of is that thing in the road. And then she says, oh, okay. Can you come by tonight? I'm like, yes. And she's like, okay, seven o'clock. I'm like, yes. And she's like, all right, uh, goodbye. I'm like, yes. All the time thinking the, the creature, right? So she and I uh, get back together and um, we just sort of peter out naturally somewhere in the middle of the year. And um, then um, in the fall of the year, a whole bunch of things just, uh, just go sideways for me. And, you know, I used to, you know, because, you know, as a young alternative kid, I was like, this is my autumn apocalypse back then during the during that time. But um, during a very short period of time, um, two weeks, I think, um, my parents divorce and it will cause me to move out of the only house that I've ever lived in. The girl uh, that I was currently dating after I was done dating Vicky, um, she uh, decides to break up with me. Uh, for a guy that she'd been dating before. And then um, in the midst of all of this, 
my friend Kyle, um, he's uh, the one in the tan jacket uh, in his picture says, oh, um, just so you know, I want to get something off my chest that, you know, when you and Vicky broke up, she and I dated for a couple months, but it's over now. I'm like, well, that's weird that you would keep that from me. Like, you know, if we're not dating anymore and he goes, yeah, I just, you know, it was just too much. I didn't just want to, I just didn't want to share that with you. I'm like, okay, that's strange. And here I am going through my parents divorcing, having to move and all that stuff. And then, and, and, and I said, well, I just want to know, you know, I, I just, I said, you know, I, I have to come to terms with that you did that and you didn't want to tell me about it. And he said, and he basically, his response was, well, if you think that was bad, our other two friends in this picture, um, the four of us were really close, tight knit. Like we were such good friends, went everywhere together that nobody could stand to be around us because of how close we were, that level of friendship. So the two guys on the outside on this picture, um, um, so we have Herb on the left and then and Don on the right in the picture. Kyle says, well, while you were dating her, the two of them would go over to her place together for shenanigans. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. And it turns out that my entire extended group of friends all knew about it. And nobody wanted to tell me about it. They're like, oh, I didn't want to be the one to tell you. I didn't want, I knew, but I didn't want to be the one to tell you. And I thought of all the times that she and I would show up at parties, knowing everybody there would know what was going on except me. So I'm the sucker. And I'm like, oh, wow, I'm like, wow, all of these things happened at once. And it didn't really leave me with any foundation. The family breaking up, my home. Um, my current girlfriend, my all my friends. <laughs> and then another thing just came in to pile on everything is, you know, in college classes, you learn about these new ways of thinking that nobody really brings up to you and, <laughs> as a kid. And one of them was, um, and I, I will overgeneralize here, and, and there's different words for determinism. Um, you know, basically, it's a it's an understanding of the cause and effect of life that nothing happens in a vacuum everything happens for a reason and so if somebody does a good thing it was because of what's happened in their background if somebody does a bad thing it's what happened in their background and i'm like well this is i was i was raised catholic for one thing and i'm like this doesn't really jive with the catholic church which i was already just barely holding on to and when i try to think of all the stuff um, that my friends had done to me that I thought distasteful. I'm like, well, I can't really blame them for cheating on my, you know, my girlfriend, you know, going behind my back with my girlfriend, because that's how they were brought up. It was their background. <laughs> so I was like disabled from, from doing anything or thinking anything except that, wow, this is just the nature of things. So it was really terrible. And so I started to think that, these beings knew what I was about to be going like at the beginning of the year. They're like, something's going to, you know, this, this year is going to be crummy for you. We're just going to let you know up front that we're here. Oddly enough, we've got your back. And one of the, the key things that brought me to that rationale was the letter that was dropped on my chest immediately after I had that experience, because that's really what kicked off for me being part of this awful roller coaster ride. Um, and so I'm like, okay, you know, that that's an interesting thing. So I went with it. I went with it that the beings were there. They cared about my life. They saw this coming and want to do uh, alert me and all that stuff. And so I, I just kept going. Um, and so at that point in my life, you know, I started to hang out a lot more with friends that had nothing to do with that group of friends. I, and because of that, I found out about the mutual UFO network and I joined in 93, like I said, after sharing, 
um, that one experience I had uh, at 80 in 89 with my two friends and then a lot of my more personal stuff. And so um, I started to go to George and Shirley Coyne's place, the uh, directors from Michigan, and you know, started a series of regressions. Now, I took this picture of their home recently. Um, I don't know why the screen door is on the outside of the railing. <laughs> it was not like that when George and Shirley were living there, but I don't know. So this one time um, that would turn out to be my last regression session with them. Um, Shirley would regress me. George would be in the other room. And the very first session that we had was me at age two. And um, I, I, I won't go into it here, but I will say um, the details are in my book that so many details came out of that two-year-old experience um, that I didn't remember, but I, I further verified to be fact um, came out because of that regression, which showed me that regressions were real. One of the key things being that I remembered my crib wrong all through my life. And then during regression, I'm like, why does my crib look so funny while I'm regressed? Well, it turned out my memory of it under regression was the real way my crib looked, not the way I remembered it in life. So anyway, that those details, uh, you know, you could, if you're interested, um, follow up with. But so um, across different regression sessions I had at the coins, um, we would look at one thing, another thing that happened in my life. And then at the sixth regression, I came in um, at this time, um, George was laying on the couch just outside of the room that Shirley would and I would go in for the regression. And he's just laying there and said, hey, George, you know, whatever. And then we went into the other room and I sat in the typical lazy boy I would sit in for our sessions. And then this time Shirley said, she goes, this time we're just going to go fishing and see, you know what we can bring out. Uh, we're not going to look at anything specific. Just ask yourself, ask them, ask the universe, whatever you want. Show me what I need to see. So that's what I did. I'm, I sit in there. I'm like, show me what I need to see. And, you know, she went through the induction and I'm sitting there and I'm just putting that thought out again and again. And every time I tried to focus on any of the things that had happened to me up until that point in my life, with my encounters, it would sort of de-res, uh, maybe to use the best word, it would blur, it would just, I could not concentrate on anything. I would say, okay, I'm going to focus on this. And then only to find I couldn't concentrate on it. And then I'm like, well, I don't know what to do anymore because obviously I'm not being successful at, at this technique. And right when I'm sitting there thinking that, I notice the room starts to get lighter and lighter and lighter. And soon everything appears to be bright white around me, just completely bright white. And it, I feel lighter and lighter. And it feels like the walls and the ceiling burst away. And then suddenly I'm floating in this pure white space. And this voice speaks to me and says, you know, you have this sort of negative filter, this lens that you look at things and you see the issues with all of these encounters and everything. And, you know, you're still here. You're fine. You know, um, your life is going well and your life will continue to go well. And we know this because we can see the entirety of your life uh, from our perspective. And you're always nervous about whether or not we're going to come back again. Well, you don't need to be nervous about wondering whether we'll come back again, because we will. We're here to tell you we're going to come back again and again and again in your life. And I, I could tell it was meant to be reassuring, but it was, you know, kind of not the message that I was, you know, thinking of hoping for or whatever. So then um, I noticed that everything started to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and um, suddenly it felt like I was thrown like a sack of potatoes into the lazy boy. Boom, this really heavy weight dropped in a chair, felt like I weighed a thousand pounds. And, and then I started to come out of the regression and Shirley says, oh, there you are. We lost you for a while. And I'm like, okay. Um, 
she goes, are you ready to share? And I said, yeah, just let me go to the bathroom first. So I got up, go to the bathroom. And since they lived in a trailer home, you know, the, the walls were quite thin. I'm standing in the bathroom doing my thing. And I hear George say to Shirley, he's like, while you were in there, three of them showed up. And she's like, what? She goes, yeah, they were standing at the end of the, like the long hallway into their bedroom. And he goes, they showed up shortly after you went in the room and they left right before you came out. And, and I'm, I'm again, I'm not with them. I'm in the bathroom overhearing this. And so I'm like, oh gosh, well, that's next level. So I, you know, I come out and I look and they both have this ashen look on their faces. And I was like, oh, so what's up? And Shirley's like, oh, nothing. And I'm like, well, I thought I heard you guys talking about something while I was in there. I just, and she goes, oh, no, that's nothing to do with anything. Uh, don't you worry about it. And I'm like, they're not going to tell me. For whatever reason, they are not going to tell me what happened when I was in there. And I'm like, okay, this is like officially too strange. And I'm like, I think I should just go, I said. And I walked out and I drove home. And an interesting thing happened when I got home and got into bed, which was I didn't feel the need to lock the door, keep the, the curtains drawn. No radio, no TV, no lights. I felt completely fine to sleep in the dark by myself from that point on. And that was, you know, like what, 90, like 30 years. <laughs> For 30 years, I have not needed any of those security blankets. And it was because of that session that day. And I'll be darned, I can't logically say that what they said was reassuring. Um, but it worked. And so I go with it. And it was one of the things that I thought was uh, um, beneficial for them to do for me. It was my last session with Shirley. And uh, shortly after that, she left MUFON. Her husband passed. And now she's also passed as well. Um, but um, so for years after that initial sort of autumn apocalypse that I had, um, I had trouble forming and, and keeping um, close relationships uh, with women. And it was just sort of a, a period where I couldn't bring myself to relax or trust. Um, I eventually made my way back in with some of the friends from that particular group that knew but didn't say what was happening and so my friend tj has this uh cabin up north in lewiston michigan and um he invited me uh one weekend to go skiing with a group of people here's tj washing dishes here inside the cabin here's an exterior of the cabin and i'm like yeah sure that's fine i'll go i'll go on a ski trip and then he contacts me uh, not long after, and he says, oh, um, Vicky's going to be there with her new husband. I'm like, she doesn't ski. And he's like, yeah, but she heard about the trip. She just wants to come and hang out up north. Um, so I'm like, well, does she know that I'm going? And he's like, yeah, she knows. And I'm like, this is really strange. I'm like, I'm not going to blink. And she didn't blink either. And it ended up that we were both there on this trip. So here on the right is a picture of them. Um, here's Vicky sitting down and her husband um, behind her. He turned out to be quite a character, too. Um, and he went around uh, most of the weekend shirtless, which nobody tended to do in uh, he decided that was his the way he was going to go. He uh, he would ask people what they did for a living and then make fun of it. And um, we uh, we needed somebody to make a beer run. And he said, I'll go. And so he came back with the cheapest beer he could find because he said that way he get to, got to keep the most change. And then probably the worst is our, our one of our friends 
made this wonderful giant pot of chicken soup. And then after he was done eating his soup, he poured the broth back into the pot. And um, so he was yeah, a very endearing character. And so I'm like, you know, just, oh. So there were so many people at the cabin this time that it was probably the most on a single trip I'd ever seen, especially in the winter. Um, there was very little place to, to sleep. And so I decided to be clever. Um, the water was shut off during the winter and we used a, an outhouse. So the bathroom was there, just not doing anything. So what I decided to do was I used some of the um, the cushions from the outdoor chairs and I, I, I lined them up in the bathtub and I slept in the bathtub and it was fine. Um, but the second night we're there, I'm laying in the tub, um, just trying to fall asleep. And then I and then Vicky and her husband took the room next to me, the only room with uh, a, a big enough bed for two people. And I hear him sort of laughing and giggling and talking. And then I could tell that they were starting to get a little amorous. And then they got full on amorous. They were making very loud love in the room right next to me while I was laying in the bathtub on the summer couch cushions, outdoor cushions. And I thought, this is like the most ridiculously stupid thing um, I, I have I could ever imagine. This is crazier than whatever I could imagine. And it was at that moment, I'm like, I can no longer take her seriously. And that means I could no longer take that event that was weighing on me seriously. And I just started laughing, laughing out loud, just raucously laughing. I couldn't stop myself. And so I didn't want to wake everybody in the place up. So I just ran outside the cabin and I felt like this tremendous burst of energy. And I'm just running down the road laughing, ha, 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 whatever. And then suddenly I'm like, this feels familiar. And I'm, I had this strange sense of deja vu. And then I look up ahead and there's this house. I'd never been that far down the street. We would just pull up to his cabin. No need to go any further. But there's this house. I, I look up ahead. I'm like, oh my gosh, I am in that dream, whatever you want to call it, from uh, the beginning of 91. I am there now. This is my reality now. And there's this place up ahead. So I walk up to it and this time nobody's in front. Nobody's there. And I realize I'm like, okay, now I've completed this life circuit. From this point on, I'm free. I can live again. Everything's cool again. Um, I can move forward from here. Everything's great. And here's a picture of the group the next day and how stupidly delighted I am here in the picture <laughs> where everybody else is in the picture. So um, so I was able to love again, essentially. And um, I, I tell all this because, you know, I, I go through a story like this to show how deeply interested these beings are in, in our personal lives when you are a frequent flyer. Um, and this next story here, I think really takes the cake and really makes a point on that. And I'm getting close to wrapping up just so, you know, just, uh, I'll wind down with a couple of, uh, things here. So shortly after that, uh, event that was January of 1995, um, like I said, I'm raring to go ready to get again. And it just was a couple few months later, I picked up with this, uh, girl, Tammy, and we decided to go hiking one day. And so here's me and here's her with the blocked out face. Um, this is, these pictures were taken from the day of the event that I'm about to talk about. So she and I are, uh, we go out hiking and as we, uh, we intended to go home before the sun went down, but then she's like, Oh, you know, let's, let's, let's see if we can find a nice place and watch the sunset. So we climb up this hill. It's sort of sandy down at the bottom, but nice up on the top. So we're up on top of this hill here. And then the sun goes down and then 
they're like, oh, let's stargaze. And we had a blanket that we brought for picnic purposes. So we laid it out. And so we're laying on the blanket smooching at this point. And um, the, there were sound of frogs all around us um, off in the distance and other sort of foresty noises that you'd expect when all of a sudden they all went silent. It's completely quiet. And we're like, well, that's weird. Why is it quiet? And then we distinctly heard footsteps coming up the hill. Spooked both of us. We went into the center of the hill. We're looking around. We don't see anything. And she says, um, just sort of to break the silence, she's like, oh, look, it's the Big Dipper. And I said, well, actually, that's the Little Dipper. I know because I took this uh, um, astronomy class really early in the morning um for college and i took such great notes i know all about the stars now and whatever and then we start talking about the price of college textbooks and everything's cool and then we go and we the frogs are doing their thing again and so we go and we lay down and then after a little bit the frog stop and i had forgotten about what had just happened this is a very difficult story to tell because it deals with time being messed up so we're laying on the blanket, the frog stop, we get up and we hear footsteps because we hear footsteps coming up the hill. We go to the center of the hill and she says, look, it's the Big Dipper. And I say Little Dipper. And we start talking about college, the price of textbooks, and then we're fine and we go to lay down again. I didn't remember that second time that we'd had the conversation once already until the third time it hit me. We lay back down in the blanket, hear the, the frog stop, the footsteps up the hill. We go back to the center of the hill, start talking about everything we had just talked about. And it was that point that it hit me. I'm like, we have had this conversation at least twice so far. This is the third time that we're talking about this. I'm like, that is a big red flag. We need to get out of here. And the thing about when you're an experiencer and you start dating somebody you first of all you don't want to lead with that in most cases because you want to find out what they think about that phenomena and people who experience it and all that um, you don't want them to think you're crazy but if you wait too long the problem that you find is that they are going to participate in the experience with you whether they like it or not and that's even worse than not telling them so i kind of misread that line i guess because here we are up on this hill, and I know we have to get the heck out of here fast as we can, and I don't know what to say to her, when suddenly we're both frozen, completely frozen, unable to move, we're facing each other, and three little gray guys come up the hill, and they don't seem particularly interested in me, they're all completely interested in her. They're walking around her. They're looking her up and down. And I could hear their telepathic banter. Like, no, not her. Mm -mm, no, she's no good. No, she's not the one for him. Mm -mm. No, no. And then they walked out on the hill and we could move again. We grabbed our stuff and we ran. We must have ran like a mile to get to the car. We were that far from it. And we get in the car and we're driving back home in complete silence. And... <clears throat> Then when we got close to home, she's like, you know, I was going to drop her off. She says, I'm not ready to go home yet. She goes, let's go someplace where there's people. So we go to Meyer Thrifty Acres, big box store, open 24 hours at that time. And we're walking up and down the aisles, like picking up mops, looking at, you know, like bottles of vitamins, just anything to sort of ground ourselves um, in normalcy. We end up in the pet aisle. We're looking at hamsters because they're nocturnal and they're doing their thing. And so after we watch the hamsters for about 20 to 30 minutes, she says, okay, I think I can go home now. And so I, I you know, we go out to the car. I drop her off. Um, the next day we don't talk at all. The day after that, she calls and says, I, I think you should come over. And so I do. And she breaks up with me um, on the spot. And while I hadn't told her that what had happened to us had anything to do with me, I think she knew full well it had everything to do with it, with me. And um, 
that was pretty much it. We had almost no interaction after that in life. And um, so it was a very interesting thing that the beings came in and very directly said, no, this relationship is cannot happen. But on the flip side, I eventually met a woman who the phenomena where it runs in my mom's side of the family, it runs in her dad's side of the family. And um, the, the, the beings brought us together uh, very clearly under a number of circumstances that were synchronistic beyond uh, just like saying, oh, that must have been a coincidence. And we ended up moving into our own gray house. And I think the funny thing about it is, is that our house has a bel the master bedrooms up on the second floor with this balcony right here, meaning that I've just put, I've just, we've just moved into a house where anytime the aliens can want, want they can just land on the roof and um, pull us right out of the balcony. <laughs> yeah, they're like, come on, come out. <laughs> so for me, you know, I, I thought um, I've, I've had nothing but support from my family, my friends, even my work. Um, people will come up to me at my work all the time and say, oh, I did you watch this TV show or listen to this UFO event that happened to me or somebody I know? And since I've been blessed and I've been so lucky to just have support, I feel that it's one of the reasons that I do so much for outreach to tell my story, to listen to other stories, to be a part of MUFON is because I can. So many people say, I'd like to participate, but my work wouldn't have it. My wife doesn't want me to do this. It's too much uh, for me to do this. I could never possibly share this. But for me, again, my earliest memory of age two is of an experience. So this isn't just part of my life. This is my life, my whole life. Uh, my encounters have gone on certainly beyond what I've told. And at one point down the road, uh, I'll be opening my mouth about the more recent things that have happened. In fact, some of them are stranger than anything I've even said today. But um, I certainly appreciate your time. If you want to find out more about my encounters, like I said, these books, uh, otherwise, uh, I thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jared. Uh, thank you, everybody there at Minnesota MUFON for listening to my uh, personal story of what has happened to me. Cool. Thank you, Bill. Let's everybody give Bill Kolonkoleski a big round of applause. Michigan MUFON Chapter Director.